Okay, let's get started. I think the bell already rang, right? 16 past. Okay, we're already at lecture 18. Nobody has questions, right? Okay. I guess this is supposed to be for the person who's asking a question. I don't know if it works. Okay, we're going to cover out-of-order execution. That doesn't mean that it's broken execution. It's just out-of-the-program order execution. Uh, so let's get that clear first. But a few announcements. Well, where, where are we? Uh, I think we've covered all of this, actually, uh, so far. We're here, we're going to talk about other execution paradigms and hopefully move into memory. Oh, that's in your way? Okay. You have a question? Okay. Okay, so we posted uh, upon one of uh, your fa uh, fellow colleagues' requests some exercises, practice exercises. Hopefully this will be useful for you. It's optional. We can give you extra credit maybe if you do well. So feel free to return. Uh, your answers, it's online at the course website. I think most importantly, this is good for your learning of the material. And we're, this is the practice set for one. Uh, there will be another practice set and maybe another practice set. Again, this is just for you to learn. It's not included in, the, uh, in your grade, if you will. But that's how it is. Maybe in the future years, we'll include it, uh, this as part of the grade. Uh, and there are some interesting questions here. Uh, some of which may, may look like questions that may come in the exam in the future. <laughs> okay, readings. Hopefully you've done this reading. Uh, this lecture may be easier if you have. And there's an optional reading. This is not a required reading. Uh, this is more advanced. This is uh, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation's Alpha 21264 microprocessor. It's described by its chief architect, Rick Kessler. Uh, it's a very dense reading, so... I'm recommending it to you if you really want to go into the detail of how a modern microprocessor works. And you can see that it's relatively old, but the concepts are all the same for out-of-order execution today. Since then, it's been mainly optimization of the circuitry, as well as the logic, as well as the architecture, to minimize power consumption. Power consumption has been a huge issue uh, in the 2000s, and people have tried to figure out how to design algorithms, hardware algorithms in the architecture to minimize the uh, power consumption and complexity of out-of-order execution. So we're going to talk about out-of-order execution without all of those optimizations, just the basic uh, algorithm uh, to, to make it work. But the fundamentals, principles are all the same, basically. Okay, well, I've already announced this before, but I'll keep this over here just in case you want to see what future computing architectures might be. Okay, let's... Uh, oh, before I move on, uh, if you send me an email, and if you don't get an answer, please send me again. Redundancy helps. I get a lot of email, and I lose them sometimes. Actually, there are a lot of failure mechanisms until I get to see the email, and even after I see the email, there's, there are many failure mechanisms. I may not get to the point to respond to the email, right? That's, so certainly, don't assume that the email reaches me in the first place. Second place, don't assume that even if it reaches me, you, I will be able to send you an answer. <laughs> so redundancy, redundancy is always a good approach to fault tolerance, right? Whenever you have faults, you want to do redundancy. So in this case, what you would be doing would be redundant execution, repeating the execution so that hopefully the outcome of the execution reaches me. <laughs> yeah, that's an unfortunate fact of life, but don't, uh, don't feel that uh, I'm ignoring you or I'm mad at you for some reason. Probably not. Why wouldn't be? <laughs> Why would I be? Just see this as a fault in the system and uh, design mechanisms or try to overcome that faulty execution, if you will. <laughs> I mean, if, if I were teaching a dependable execution course, this would be a really fun topic, actually. But we don't have time for reliable architectures. Uh, although you got a glimpse of that with the row hammer part earlier. Okay, 
So uh, this is where we left off, basically. Basically, we designed an in-order pipeline with a reorder buffer to ensure that uh, we obey the precise exception semantics or sequential execution semantics of the von Neumann architecture. And just to uh, jog your memory, because we're going to build upon this, uh, in the decode stage, we access the register file and reorder buffer and allocate an entry for the instruction in the reorder buffer. Check if instruction can execute, meaning that it, if it has satisfied the dependencies. And we've eliminated the output and anti-dependencies, if you remember, right after read and right after write dependencies by renaming the registers to the reorder buffer entries. Right? So we're only stalling on flow dependencies, the true dependencies, read uh, after write. So if the instruction can execute, meaning that it doesn't depend on any of the instructions over here, you can dispatch the instruction. Dispatch means send to the functional unit. And we have multiple functional units with different latencies. And the, even a single functional unit may take different latencies, as we've discussed. Multiply by zero, for example, can take much shorter than multiply by 1,238. Uh, and then instructions execute, uh, and they can complete out of order, out of the program order. And when they complete, they write results, uh, their results into the reorder buffer. And only when they're ready to retire, meaning they're at the head of the reorder buffer, they're the oldest instruction in the machine, and they don't have an exception, and we're not handling an interrupt, then they can write the result to the architectural register uh, file or memory, one instruction at a time. Otherwise, if there's a problem, meaning if there's an exception, you flush the pipeline and start from the exception handler or the interrupt handler. So th this is a machine that works and that obeys the von Neumann semantics, sequential execution semantics. Uh, okay, I'll go through this again because we're going to talk about registry naming a lot today. Basically, remember that output and anti. Output dependency is right after write. Anti dependency is you do a write after read to the same register. These are not true dependencies because you don't need the data value. They're, they're really uh, uh, dependence on a name of the register, right? The same register refers to values that have nothing to do with each other. You write to the register, and then later, five instructions later, you write to the same register again because you don't have enough registers in the ISA. So in, in the reorder buffer lecture, last lecture, if you remember, we re renamed the register ID to the reorder buffer entry that will hold the register's value. That's the mapping. Uh, you could think of this as renaming an architectural register ID that's visible to the ISA to a physical register ID. In fact, if you read... Uh, uh, how modern processors are built today, you'll see the physical registers. Basically, these are registers that are inside the microprocessor that are not visible to the programmer. Basically, you're renaming into those. And reorder buffer can be thought of as a physical register, right? Each entry is a physical register. And after renaming, reorder buffer entry ID is used to refer to the register. So if another instruction needs that particular value that was written to R2, it gets, it gets linked to the reorder buffer entry that's going to produce that value, R2. Right? If there's another write to R2, then it gets mapped to another reorder buffer entry. And then if another instruction later is going to read that new definition of R2, if you will, then it will refer to that new reorder buffer entry. So we will see that this is really uh, important for out-of-order execution because now you're linking the dependent instructions and you're eliminating all other uh, uh, dependencies or fake, false dependencies. Basically, in other words, we're giving the illusion that there are a large number of registers. And we are actually, because reorder buffer is large. We can make it large. We can make it 128 entries. And in fact, a lot of existing processors are getting close to 256 entries now. Even though you may have only 32 registers, you have a reorder buffer entry that's, a reorder buffer that's as large as 256. And one of the big uh, important uh, challenges in processor design today is how do you make it larger such that you can have more instructions in the machine. And you will see how, why, why that's important uh, in this lecture. So let's, uh, like, like anything else, uh, the order buffer has advantages and disadvantages too. Uh, well, I'll give you the advantages. Basically, it's conceptually simple for supporting precise exceptions. I mean, everybody can think of this perhaps, right? You reorder the instructions at the end, even though you may execute things out of order in the middle of the pipeline. Uh, and it can eliminate false dependencies. Basically, it enables renaming. That's an advantage. Basically, it enables more parallelism in the machine. Instead of stalling, you, you can go ahead. But it also has disadvantages that we've covered in the last lecture. Basically, as you've seen, 
It needs to be accessed to get the results that are yet to be written to the register file because there's a period where you don't write to the register file, but you keep the result in the reorder buffer. But what if a dependent instruction needs that result? Well, that instruction needs to be able to read the reorder buffer. So we saw two methods of handling this, basically searching the reorder buffer for the register ID at the time when you're actually uh, uh, decoding the instruction. This required a content addressable memory, just jogging your memory again, which is expensive because you really are searching uh, a memory based on its content. Or you have indirection, basically, the register file entry has a valid bit. If it's not valid, it stores, the, it stores a pointer to the reorder buffer entry that's going to produce that register. And this is all in the past lecture. So if, if you missed the past lecture, you should uh, go and watch the videos. By the way, how many of you are watching the videos? OK, good. I guess the videos are still updated, right? Because I haven't checked the latest videos. OK, good. Uh, so the, the problem is both of these solutions lead to increased latency and complexity. Uh, and there is no easy way of getting around it. So people have actually developed other solutions, which we are not going to cover. But in an advanced architecture course, you will see that uh, there are other solutions to this problem. And modern microprocessors actually incorporate a combination of these solutions. Uh, it's not just the reorder buffer, but they also do checkpointing and future files, which I'm going to tease you with, but I'm not going to ask you to know, or uh, I'm, I'm not going to explain. We just don't have time for these things. OK, well, we've talked about registers, but uh, just to uh, broaden your thinking, uh, registers are not the only place where dependencies may exist. Actually, memory uh, is, has a much larger address space, right? Uh, and if you think about it, reorder buffer eliminates dependencies inside the register file. But what about memory? You can have a, low, a store instruction that's dependent on a load. And we've discussed this briefly. Uh, and you can have vice versa. You can have a load instruction that's dependent on a store later on, right? But there are fundamental differences between registers and memory. Can anybody guess? Tell me one of them. I'll give you one. Well, you know, by looking at a program, you know exactly which instructions are dependent on each other. Ignore control flow for now. Uh, by looking at straight line code, you can see that, oh, this instruction is dependent on this other instruction because this instruction is writing register 2 and this instruction is reading from register 2. Right? So if instructions are dependent on each other based on the registers, then you can easily see that at the compile time. The problem is memory dependencies most of the time are determined dynamically meaning you generate an address based on a register value or based on some input, and you don't know that address before executing the program. Right. That's why we have register plus offset addressing, for example, for when you're indexing an array, for example. In fact, uh, for example, you, if you're doing a search on a dictionary and a linked data structure, you input a word, and you want to figure out what uh, the meaning of that word is. First of all, if it exists in the dictionary. Your input is dependent on the user. You put a word, and you don't know that until runtime. So all of the addresses that you touch are generated dynamically. So there is no way to analyze those dependencies at the software, at the compiler level. At the hardware level, again, it's hard because you don't know whether or not a, a load instruction is dependent on a store until you execute and figure out the addresses of both. And remember, when we figure out the addresses of both, we need to ex execute them, right? We cannot just decode them. Whereas register dependencies are known at decode time in hardware. Right? You decode and you figure out, oh, I, I'm accessing these registers and somebody else was writing these registers, so I know those easily. But memory is determined much later in the pipeline. And this caused a lot of issues. Uh, the other issue is register state is small. You normally have 8, 16, 32 registers, whereas memory state is large. Right? You have a huge address space in memory. If you have a 64-bit addressable memory, then you have 2 to the 64 memory locations, bytes, let's say. Now, even, detect, uh, even, even checking whether the address of a load matches the address of a store becomes more complex, right? Because you're not comparing 5-bit register IDs, you're comparing 64-bit memory addresses. 
And the last one is register state is not visible to other threads or, and processors. Memory state is shared between threads and processors in a shared memory multiprocessor. We haven't talked about these, but when you put multiple processors together, and if you program them using the shared memory programming model, which we're probably not going to get into in this course, uh, then the registers are not visible to different threads, but memory is visible. And this causes complications when you do programming and when you are updating the state of memory. Because if you update the state of memory incorrectly, or if you do it too early, then some other thread may get the wrong value. You don't have that issue in registers because the registers are just separate between the different threads. Okay, we're not going to concern ourselves over here, but think about the implications of these two, uh, especially when we talk about out-of-order execution. Uh, but let me give you a, a, a glimpse of it right now. So let me go back to this picture over here. Uh, Imagine you have a load pipeline and a store pipeline that's separate from each other. And a store instruction may take really long because it's dependent on an instruction that's generating its address. And that address is dependent on uh, some long latency operation. Whereas a load instruction takes really short, a younger load. So you have a store that's older, you have a load that's younger. Now this load needs to execute early or it generates its address early. But now you have a store in the machine, in the pipeline, whose address you don't know. What do you do? Right, that's, that's the problem, basically. Let's go back. Basically, when a store instruction finishes its execution, oh, oh that's, that's one problem. But there's, there's, uh, that's actually a more difficult problem than what's over here. Basically, when a store instruction finishes execution, it writes its address and data in its reorder buffer entry. Let's assume that you, uh, you finished that store instruction. You know its address and data. When a later instruction generates its address, a later load instruction generates its address, it's, how, do you, how does it get the data? Well, if you want to do the forwarding, the data is really uh, either in the store, reorder buffer entry or in memory, right? But if there's a store instruction in the reorder buffer entry, you, you'd better search the reorder buffer with the address and access memory with the address and pick the one that's the youngest. Receive the value from the youngest, older instruction that wrote to that address, either from the reorder buffer or memory. So now you have a complication in the pipeline, right? Uh, I'll, I'll show this. Uh, basically, this is, in the end, this turns out to be a very complicated search logic implemented as content addressable memory. And it's very hard to get rid of this content addressable memory in the machine. Let me give you a quick glimpse of it. Why? by wasting one of my precious slides that I prepared for out-of-order execution. But we have, we have redundancy. That's good. OK, I guess we need to switch. How do we switch? PC, doc. And you told me that I should turn on the autofocus that's turned off. Or maybe I should focus first and then turn off the autofocus. What do you think? Do you see? OK, this is our reorder buffer, Rob. And there's a pointer to the oldest. There's a pointer to the youngest instruction, which I turned off now. OK, so let's assume that this, uh, there are a bunch of instructions. And some of them happen to be stores, store, store, store. And this store goes to address, I don't know, let's say A. And this store goes to address B. This store goes to address C. And let's assume that the, these stores have all completed, even the simplest situation right now. And now you're trying to do a load, and its address happens to be B. So you execute it. You generate the address. After that, you need to access memory. Now there's also the memory over here. Uh, basically, to be able to get the address B, what you need to do is access memory and access the reorder buffer, just like what we did in the register file, right? The register can be in either the register file or the reorder buffer. And memory location can be, the latest value of the memory location can be either in memory or the reorder buffer. Now, this is easy, right? You basically index the memory with B, and memory is a linear array. Uh, just like the register file, addresses go from 0 to 2 to the n, where you have n-bit addressability. And in this case, b, you just index and then get the value. 
Okay, that's easy. We're going to look at that later on. But this is harder because now reorder buffer, if you remember, instructions are stored in their uh, sequential program order There's, without any relationship to the address that you're trying to search inside. So what you need to do is do a content addressable search that's, uh, and search for B. That means you compare every possible address in the reorder buffer with B. You remember this, hopefully. Dot, dot, dot. And this is a wide comparison, if this is a 64-bit address. And you need to get the latest instruction that matches. Right. Latest instruction that matches is this one. Now, this store might have been storing into B. Now, you have multiple matches over here. You need to choose this one, because this is the latest or youngest instruction that wrote to B before uh, this load. So there may be many of these B addresses over here. Does that make sense? So it's a complicated search. In fact, it's more complicated than what I described because usually you have different types of loads and stores in a machine. You may have a store byte, uh, or, or let's say store word, store word, and you may be doing a load byte. You really need to figure out whether this load is overlapping with the store, right? And if you're doing a load word, and there are multiple stores, store bytes, store bytes, store bytes, store bytes. They may all be writing to different parts of the word you're trying to load. So this store byte might be writing to this location, this store byte might be writing to this location, this store byte to this location, and this location. Which means that this load is really dependent on all of the stores that are writing to that word over here. So now you have a really not a content listable search that's an exact match, but you're really doing a range search. You're trying to check if this address over here, uh, the range is basically address, comma, address, plus size. Usually you have a size associated with loads and stores. Uh, and you're trying to check if there's an overlap between the store address and the load address comma, load address, plus size, which really sucks, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> because this is, now it's complicated. And on top of that, you, you're doing it on all of the entries, and you want to get the youngest entry. So there's an ordering associated with it. There's content addressing, range search, overlap search, and ordering, all three together. And this is why, exactly why this part of the machinery is the most complicated part of the machinery in an existing processor. This, this, this processor, unfortunately, is spending a lot of time now reordering memory operations. This was called the memory ordering buffer, MOB, in Pentium Pro. And that was a very complicated piece of logic that actually consumed a lot of power. Later on, Intel optimized this very heavily, but it still exists. This is very hard to uh, get rid of, unfortunately. Okay, so hopefully that gives you an idea of difficulties in memory. If you think registers are difficult, memory is much more difficult. Okay, and you now know the reasons. Okay, basically, in this case, the content is memory address, but you also need size and age, as I just described. And this is called store-to-load forwarding logic, or store-to-load memory dependence uh, checking logic. And if you take an advanced course from me, we'll go into more detail on this one, but not, not in this course. Any questions on this? It's, it's a bit fascinating, right? That a lot goes on in this machine to just get the performance high. So, okay, why does it matter? So you can ask, why do we care about this? Like, how much does it impact performance? If You, know, you could do the dumb thing, right? You could say, uh, whenever I have uh, a store instruction, I'll just stall all the loads and wait until that store instruction is done and it's out of the pipeline. That's one option that basically, that way you don't need to do the search, right? That's basically what we did with register dependencies early on. If you, you, can, you can always stall. The problem is uh, there, there have been a lot of studies that show that if you do that, you lose almost 50% performance in a machine, especially in an aggressive machine that employs out-of-order execution, for example. Actually, in some cases, more than 50% performance because there are a lot of memory operations that you need to do and there are a lot of dependencies. For example, if you do a function call, what happens is you save the registers onto the stack 
Those are stores. And you, when you get out of the function, you load the registers back. Now you have a store load dependency. Right? And those addresses may be calculated in different ways. OK. So let's move to out of order execution. Uh, basically, this is the pipeline that we've built so far. And I remind you, dispatch is the act of sending an instruction to a functional unit. This is an in order pipeline still. Uh, and we, we've seen that renaming with a reorder buffer eliminates stalls due to false dependencies. But we always want higher performance. The problem in this pipeline, if you look at it, if you always ask, I want to do better, I want to get higher performance which is always a good thing to strive for, you will immediately see the problem. A true data dependency stalls the dispatch of younger instructions into functional or execution units. Right? False dependencies, we've eliminated, that's good. But if you have a true dependency when you're decoding this instruction, if there's another instruction writing to the same register, you need to stall. OK, let's take a look at those true dependencies. So we have these. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm giving you these two pieces of code. But let's, let's take a look at one of them first. So if you look at this, you're doing a multiply, you're doing an add, and these blue the, the add, the red instructions depend on the multiply, but all of these blue instructions are independent, and they can be executed. And in this pipeline, unfortunately, they cannot even get into the pipeline. I mean, they can get into the pipeline, but they will stall here. They cannot get to the execution units. They cannot be dispatched, right? Why can they not be dispatched? Because we have nowhere to put them, right, in the pipeline. If we dispatch them, they cannot, because, uh, they cannot go because they need to wait for the results that is produced by someone else. So first of all, we're going to fix that problem by putting them somewhere aside. Uh, but let me uh, make a point here. These two codes look very similar to each other, right? Except I change this multiply with a load. And add is still dependent on the load in this case. Uh, they both actually stole the pipeline. The, the first add, when you decode it, it stole the whole pipeline in both cases. Uh, so they cause the same problem here. But, uh, and, and add cannot dispatch because the source registers are unavailable. Actually, in this case, only one source register is unavailable, assuming that R1 is available. And later, inst independent instructions, the blue ones, cannot get executed. I'll also ask you, how are the above code portions different? I'll give you the answer, since we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, but basically, in modern processors, actually, you can correct me also, because multiply may not be a good choice here, based on what I told you earlier. Uh, the load latency is variable. It's unknown until runtime, because there are memory hierarchies, and load may hit in the cache, hit in some other cache, hit in some other cache, or go all the way to memory. So your latency can vary all the way from two cycles, or one cycle, to a 1,000 cycles. Whereas multiply latency, let's assume that it's fixed always. It's five cycles, let's say. Now, the two pieces of code is very different, in fact. Because here, you know the latency is fixed of multiply. Now, the compiler can reorder instructions such that these blue ones come before the multiply, and hopefully, you eliminate most of the stall. Whereas here, it's not clear if that's a good idea. If your load latency is sometimes one cycle, sometimes a 1,000 cycles, how do you optimize the code? Compiler doesn't have information about how long this load will take. Right. So it cannot do, it can do some reordering, but it cannot do perfect reordering to eliminate the stalls all the time. In fact, if the load latency is sometimes one cycle and the compiler says, oh, I'm going to put these instructions early on and I'm going to put 10 instructions after the load, that may not be a good idea because you're, now you're delaying the ad. Delaying the ad may not, may eventually delay the entire program. So it's, uh, the compilers have the difficult task of optimizing the program for the entire execution. Moving these instructions over here, assuming that the load latency is, let's say, five cycles, may not be a good idea, because if the load takes one cycle, this dependency is immediately satisfied. So that's the difference between these two pieces of code, assuming that multiply takes uh, a constant uh, number of cycles. OK. Uh, so, again, here, th this piece of code is actually where out-of-order execution will be more useful because the compiler doesn't do the reordering, or it can still do the reordering, but the hardware will figure out that reordering. And hardware, it maybe it doesn't know the exact latency of the load, but it knows when it's going to stall for the load because it's happening dynamically. At runtime, you get the load, and 
you know that it's going to miss in the cache, so you, you're going to take more than, I don't know, some number of cycles. But now you can actually execute independent instructions. So hardware can actually do this much more efficiently. Whereas the software can potentially do this more efficiently, assuming it can find the independent instructions over here. Because here, the latencies are known. So out of order execution, takeaway, don't, you don't know the exact mechanisms yet, but it's really beneficial in cases where the latency is variable. And that's usually memory operations. When your latency is variable, compiler has a difficult task because it doesn't know what the latency would be. So the hardware can reorder instructions to tolerate that variable latency. OK, but people, uh, you, you can argue that hardware actually is good at this also, but compiler may be more efficient, assuming it can uh, find, that in, find those independent instructions. OK, so our goal is to prevent dispatch stalls. Uh, you, we've already seen multiple ways of doing it. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to give this to you again. Fine-grained multi-threading. You don't have any dispatch stalls because you've eliminated the dependency problem, right? We've seen it. Value prediction, we didn't go into detail, but you can, you can guess the idea, basically. At this point, for example, load. It's, I don't know the value. Uh, add is dependent on it. So I'm going to guess R3 is going to be 0. And I'm going to execute based on that assumption. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to flush the pipeline and re-execute with the correct value. Right. That's one guess. Why does it work? Well, if your array is all zeros, that sounds good, right? Then it'll work. <laughs> so, but this is very dependent on your value prediction accuracy. So that's one option. And we've just talked about compile time, instruction scheduling, and reordering. So if you reorder these instructions, maybe you won't experience the stall, uh, dispatch stall, because by the time you, this add gets to the dispatch point, uh, the load is already resolved. The load already loaded the data. OK. So, and there are disadvantages and advantages to the above three. We've discussed this. I'm not going to go into the detail. For example, with value prediction, one disadvantage is figuring it out, right? Figuring out that you made the wrong decision. So you, you, you basically speculated on the value, saying, uh, me, meaning that you, uh, you guessed the value, but you need to have a mechanism to recover from the wrong guess in that case. And that means you need to wait until the load finishes and check the value that you predicted for the load with the correct value. And if you're wrong, you flush the pipeline. If you're right, that's good because you don't need to do anything else. You just keep continuing, right? Uh, and we've discussed the fine-grained multi-threading advances and disadvantages and compile time instructions, scheduling and reordering advances and disadvantages. So another way to prevent dispatch stalls is out-of-order execution. And we've already seen the idea with the data flow, if you will. So we're going to go back to the data flow and incorporate some more of the data flow principles into this von Neumann architecture. Remember, in the data flow case, uh, we fetched and fired an instruction only when its inputs, operands, are ready. Right? If the two operands coming to this data flow node are ready, are produced, you can fetch and fire that and execute it. Basically, we're going to imitate that in a limited manner in the pipeline now. Basically, we're going to get rid of in-order dispatch and do out-of-order dispatch. Whenever we're going to figure out whether the inputs of an instruction are ready by keeping doing some bookkeeping on the site, which I'm going to describe. And when the, if the inputs are ready, we're going to dispatch that instruction at that time. We're not going to dispatch that instruction based on the order. We've seen it, but we're going to dispatch the instruction based on whether or not its inputs are ready. Make sense? So it's really a data flow principle going into the control flow architecture. And first, to be able to do this, you really need to create space for these instructions, basically. You cannot just uh, have this. Uh, you can, at the decode stage, uh, you cannot have a single pipeline register, if you will. So basically, you need to move these instructions somewhere. Move the dependent instructions out of the way of the independent ones, such that independent ones can execute. That's the idea. Dependent ones go somewhere and wait until their inputs are ready. And independent ones can hopefully execute. Now, the machinery I'm going to describe will put both independent and dependent instructions in the same place just for simplicity purposes. And you're going to see how it works. So I think of this as rest areas for dependent instructions, right? So if, you, if, you have, if you're on the highway driving a car, and if you have one lane, let's say, if you need to rest, you don't just stop the car in the middle of the highway, right? 
Stopping the car in the middle of the highway means everybody gets backed up. Just like we did in the in-order execution, right? That, instru that instruction needed some rest. All of the other instructions that are independent, do they need that rest also at the same time? No. Basically create a rest area next to the highway, move, the instruct move your car into the rest area, and let the independent instructions flow. Right? So that's the analogy I have. It's a little bit different uh, in the implementation, but you could uh, make it work. So, and we'll call these the reservation stations. We could have called it the instruction rest areas. In fact, instruction rest area is a better term, I think, than a reservation station. That's a, that's a historical name. Okay, so while the instructions are resting in this rest area, they monitor the source values and see if they're being ready. When all source values of an instruction are available, we can fire the instruction, dispatch the instruction. So we keep checking whether the source values of an instruction is available. And instructions are dispatched in a data flow order, not control flow order. So the benefit now is latency tolerance. You, you allow independent instructions to execute and complete in the presence of a long latency operation. Later on, I will probably ask you the question, is out-of-order execution beneficial if all instructions take only one cycle? And your answer will hopefully be no. If everything took one cycle, there is no reason to rest. So you can think of latency as resting, right? So this makes a lot of sense when you have long latency operations. And long latency could be two cycles, three cycles. If you have a lot of variable latency, now it becomes even more beneficial. So let me give you an example over here. This is in-order dispatch and precise exceptions. This is the piece of code that I have over here. Uh, and if you look at uh, the execution of this piece of code, this ad is dependent. Uh, what do I have over here? OK. Oh, okay. This is this is stalling. Yeah, this is this is the correct. Okay, because this is this is the in order. This is the in order case. So if you look at this, uh, this ad is independent of previous instructions. But because this ad, uh, the second ad, cannot move, it needs to stall. This ad also needs to stall. This ad needs to rest, and the next ad, it's independent, needs to rest also. Sounds bad. That's why you take 16 cycles over here. But in out of order execution, you realize that this ad that's dependent needs a rest, so you move it to the rest area, it waits in the rest area, in the reservation stations. Now you cleared the decode stage for someone else to move. Now this instruction, the second ad over here, can be fetched and decoded while the previous ad is waiting for, the for its input value to be produced. But this ad can execute, and it writes the result into the reorder buffer, and waits to, until retirement to finish. Does that make sense? Basically, instead of stalling an instruction that's independent, you're clearing the way for that instruction by moving the dependent instructions into the rest areas. That's the idea. And the rest areas are called reservation stations. And you can see the benefit over here. It takes, in this case, 16, uh, 12 cycles to execute this code as opposed to 16 cycles. That's 25% performance improvement, which is not bad. So in this case, I've assumed that, uh, I guess, uh, anyway, maybe there's something wrong over here in terms of the length of an instruction, how long it takes. OK, but we'll, we'll do a full example soon. So how do we enable out-of-order execution? I've given you the basic concepts, actually. But there are uh, four things that you need to do. One is linkage. You need to link the consumer of a value to the producer, such that when the producer produces the value, consumer gets it, and it can it can execute, right? You need to buffer the instructions until they're ready to execute. And this is the rest area concept. But we're going to buffer all of the instructions to make things simple. Uh, instructions need to keep track of the readiness of their source values while being buffered. That's how they know when they can wake up or get out of the rest area and execute or get, get dispatched. And when all source values of an instruction are ready, you need to dispatch the instruction to its functional unit. And this is, uh, I'll give you names to this. Basically, the first one is register renaming. And we've seen how you can do that. We're going to see a very similar method soon. Basically, associate a tag with each data value, with each register. Uh, for buffering, 
we're going to use reservation stations. After we rename the instruction, we insert the instruction to the reservation stations. And while the instruction is the reservation stations, it's going to wait for values to be broadcast. So whenever an instruction finishes execution, it broadcasts the tag, the rename tag, the register it's writing to, but the name that you changed. Uh, and instructions that are waiting compare their source tags to the broadcast tag. And if, the, if there's a match, the source value becomes ready. Now, one source value may become ready, but the other source value may still not be ready. So the instruction keeps waiting. And it will eventually be broadcast. And both source values will become ready. And the instruction wakes up if all of the source values are ready. And if multiple instructions are awake, meaning multiple instructions are trying to get out of the rest area and into, back into the highway, because now they're ready to get into, you need to select one instruction per functional unit. So there, there are issues that come up uh, because multiple instructions can wake up at the same time, right? Because one instruction, one load, may have 100 instructions that are dependent on that load. Now, when that load produces its value, all instructions are awake. All instructions are ready to execute. Now you have a problem. Which one do you choose to execute, right? This is too much parallelism. Actually, this is a big problem in the data flow machines. You can have too much parallelism, if you will, because one value is produced. You have a lot of instructions to execute. So this is important to handle uh, also. OK, uh, we're going to go, uh, go over and do a, a detailed uh, overview of this. But uh, let me give you the concepts before we do that. Basically, this was invented by Robert, uh, Robert Tomasulo. It was, as I discussed last time, it was used in IBM 36091 floating point units. And this is optional reading. It's a beautiful paper. The major difference today, it didn't take off until uh, late 1990s. Actually, late 1990s, Motorola uh, 68000 was the first processor that had out-of-order execution. Actually, 88000 uh, had out-of-order execution, but it didn't see the day of light, if you will. Uh, I, uh, Intel Pentium Pro uh, implemented out-of-order execution with precise exceptions. So IBM 36091 did not have precise exceptions. It was imprecise. So it was a nightmare for the programmer to deal with this out-of-order execution logic because they, they couldn't debug the, their programs. So these are some critical papers that introduce precise exceptions uh, with out-of-order execution. And that's variants of it are used in most, probably most is an understatement over here, almost all high-performance microprocessors today. OK. So basically, uh, the way I, th I like thinking about uh, out-of-order execution is you have two humps in a modern pipeline. You have in-order, fetch, and decode. And then after that, you put the instructions into some scheduling logic, reservation stations, to schedule. And here, the instructions wait for the values and tags. And when they become ready, they wake up and they get dispatched. And that's the first hump. Basically, they rest over here. And all instructions rest initially, but then some instructions wake up very quickly because their values are immediately ready. And then after execution, you have this reorder buffer. You do the reordering. That's the re uh, and we've seen uh, already that. This is also called an instruction window or an active window. This basically has all of the instructions that are decoded, but not yet retired, not yet finished. And when you execute an instruction, it, uh, uh, it broadcasts its tag and value over here. And this is from your reading. It's more complicated than this, of course. Uh, but I like my picture because it's, it, it just <laughs> emphasizes the key points over here, right? Schedule and reorder. This is the out of order part, and this is the uh, von Neumann part, if you will. Or if you don't think about it, this is the data flow part, and this is the control flow part over here. Uh, Thomas Law's machine looked kind of like this. This is an ugly picture, sorry. Uh, I think his picture is also similarly ugly in the in 1960s, and the typesetting was not that easy if you look at that paper. But basically, he did this because funk, uh, floating point units uh, actually took very different latencies. And we're going to look at uh, an example. Uh, based on his latencies, if you will. Basically, a floating point add took four cycles, a floating point multiply took six cycles. Uh, okay, I, I'm going to skip that. Basically, we're going to rename the... Uh, give me a couple of minutes. Uh, I'll finish this, and then we'll start with the example in the later part of the uh, uh, lecture. So we're going to rename the register IDs to the reservation station IDs, but reorder buffer is similar also. We could also rename to reorder buffer IDs. OK, maybe we should start with this uh, in, uh, in 15 minutes. I'm going to walk through an example of out-of-order execution, unless you guys don't want to take a break. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK.
Okay, let's get started. We have... We're, we're going to simulate an out-of-order execution machine. But before we simulate the machine, we should look at the structures. Basically, this is a register rename table. It's very similar to the register file that we've seen before. You have a valid bit. If the valid bit says one, uh, if it's set to one, that means that the value is up to date, so you can use that. Otherwise, the value is going to be produced by the instruction that's going to write to this tag. So each register has a valid bit, value, and tag. If the valid bit says zero, that means that the instruction, uh, the, the register is renamed to the tag over here. And we'll see what tag it will be renamed to uh, in the example that I'm going to show. In the reorder buffer example last time, it was a reorder buffer entry number. Remember, when an instruction is decoded in sequential order, it allocates a reorder buffer entry in sequential order. And the tag of the register that the instruction is writing to will be renamed to that location in the reorder buffer. In that case, the entry, uh, the tag is really the reorder buffer entry number, if you will. But I'm going to give you another example. So conceptually, you can rename to anything, really, as long as you associate the register with that name. Okay, and uh, if, if the value is, va uh, if, if, the, if, you, if this is valid, the value is trusted. Okay, so Tomasov's algorithm, I'm not going to go through this, I'm going to simulate it, but this is for your reference uh, so that if you want to look at how Thomas Lowe's algorithm works, you can read this humongous text. Okay, so let's do this exercise over here. I'm going to give you this code. Actually, we're going to do it together. Uh, it's basically this piece of code which does nothing really in, in, interesting, but you could see it in existing uh, workloads. And we're going to assume a pipeline that looks like this. But we're going to assume add takes four cycles, four execute cycles, multiply takes six cycles. We're going to assume one adder and one multiplier. And they're going to be pipelines. So you can pipeline an adder and multiplier such that it takes four stages, uh, four cycles, but you input an instruction every cycle. Uh, and multiplier is also pipelined at six cycles. Then there are a bunch of questions. How many cycles does this code take in a non-pipeline machine? This sounds like a good exam question, for example. It's really easy, right? Uh, or how many cycles does this take in an in-order dispatch pipeline machine with imprecise exceptions? I'm going to do the imprecise exceptions for this case uh, because precise exceptions, is, uh, will, will, uh, you can easily add that on top of it. And you can do, have, have this with no forwarding and full forwarding. And then we're going to look at you know, in a, uh, how, uh, how long does this take in an out-of-order dispatch pipeline machine with imprecise exceptions, but with full forwarding. We're not going to do the no forwarding part here, because if you're doing all that logic machinery to do out-of-order execution, you'd, be you'd also better have full forwarding, because it's just a blip on top of the complexity you add on top of out-of-order execution. OK, uh, well, this is my beautiful handwriting. Maybe you like seeing it. Okay, uh, basically this is, uh, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but in a non-pipeline machine, this code takes this many cycles, 31 cycles. Uh, let's go through one instruction. You fetch decode, this is the six cycle multiply, and write back. And then you fetch decode, and then this needs to stall at the decode stage, and then read the registers. There's no forwarding here. It's basically scoreboarding. So after the register is written, then you can move on. It's actually a little bit pessimistic. Uh, but basically, it's 31 cycles. Depending on your assumptions on the right back stage and decode stage, you can actually reduce it because this decode can be started earlier over here. So assumptions are really important in you, if, uh, when you actually uh, answer this question because I didn't really precisely specify exactly how the right back and decode operates over here, right? So if, if, if this instruction writes to the register file in half of the cycle and if this, if this instruction reads from the register file on the other half, then this could actually be shifted by one cycle. And I think everything almost shifts by one cycle. So you could make this 30 cycles. OK. Uh, but if you have a, a uh, oh, this is a non-pipeline machine. So non-pipeline machine is much worse, actually. This is, this is a pipeline machine with in-order execution, uh, but with, uh, without data forwarding. If you have data forwarding, it looks like this. Basically, the multiply is fetched and decoded. At the end of, uh, at, at the sixth cycle, it produces its result. 
And I'm going to assume that you can forward that result to the execute stage over here. At the end of the sixth cycle, you have the results, and you can forward it uh, from the pipeline latch over here to the execute stage for the dependent instruction. Now, that dependent instruction takes four cycles. And basically, at the end of the, uh, at the last stage, when you produce the results, you can forward it. And by just forwarding, you can reduce this to 25 cycles, as you can see. So we're going to assume this forwarding in out-of-order execution also. So if you do out-of-order execution, the pipe, uh, you don't need, really need to know exactly how it works, but you can calculate how long it takes. In this case, it takes 20 cycles. Why? Uh, basically, this is the multiply over here. This is the add. Here, the add goes into the reservation station. Uh, at, the, at the end of the decode stage, it goes into the reservation station, and it wakes up uh, with forwarding when you actually forward the tag and the, uh, when you actually broadcast the tag and the value, it captures the tag and the value and becomes ready and it gets scheduled and executes. There are a lot of assumptions here in terms of how the circuit is built, but we're not going to go into that right now. Uh, and this next add over here, which is independent, can basically immediately execute uh, because its sources are ready at the decode stage and you execute it very quickly and then it writes its result. Remember, we're doing imprecise exceptions here. Just to simplify the explanation of Thomas Law's algorithm. Uh, but if we were doing precise exceptions, it would go into the reorder buffer. Uh, well, it would uh, actually allocate a reorder buffer entry over here and it would write its results into the reorder buffer over here and then do the write back after, only after this instruction is retired. Uh, so if you have imprecise exceptions, this is what you have. And it turns out this is only 20 cycles, which is much better than 25 cycles. OK, let's see how it works now. But for, to, for us to be able to see how it works, I think I'll start with uh, the pipeline model. Not, not the pipeline model, but what the machine looks like. Oh, I already have these. So the machine looks like this. <laughs> yes? Yeah. That's right, yes. And I'm going to show you how that happens. <laughs> So you're, you're going to stretch your mind a little bit because a lot of machines do that. So, but that's a very good point. You, you, you actually figured out that there, there, there could be a resource dependence over here, right? But if you have two ports into the register file, you've eliminated that, right? Again, it all de depends on your assumptions. We're going to assume a very aggressive machine in this case. Uh, or you can have two registers files, but there, that's another thing. But I like how you caught it. <laughs> It's going to become more clear when we look at out-of-order execution very soon. OK, so basically, our machine will look like this. I have a better picture of this. We're, we're going to have a register alias table, and we're going to have reservation stations that look like this. Uh, but I have a better picture over here, which you're going to uh, see. So we're going to switch to this for the rest of the lecture, I think. We can't. That's our machine. Is it clear? Basically, we have the register alias table. We have the source. Uh, this is uh, the reservation station. Let me, ex let me describe these first a little bit. Uh, basically, uh, reservation station for adder, it has four entries. As you can see, reservation station for the multiplier, it has four entries. And they have different names, A, B, C, D for the adder reservation stations and x, y, z, t for the multiplier. And what you, uh, I'm ignoring some of the fields in the reservation station here, like is it allocated, for example. There should be another allocated field over here, but I'm going to ignore for that for its simplicity right now. Basically, in a reservation station, you need to have two sources for the addition. And each source can, can be valid. If it's valid, you store the value. If it's not valid, you store the tag just like a register file entry. Same for the other source. Same for the other reservation station. Right. Basically, you allocate instructions into these different reservation station entries in program order, which means that you can actually take the source register that the instruction is sourcing and place it into the appropriate slot over here. Take the other source register from the register alias table, place it into the appropriate slot. That's how you move an instruction from the register file into the reservation station, basically. OK. And then, uh, actually, let's, let's do that. 
So let's assume this is our cycle zero. At the beginning of time, we have these instructions to execute, and this is our register file, or register alias table. It's called alias table because you can alias it to somewhere else, or register map table. People call it different things. Intel calls it RAT, register alias table. I, I like the name RAT. RMT is difficult to say. Uh, basically, every, all registers are valid. I'm going to assume you have these values which are nicely chosen. So that's cycle zero. There's nothing happening interesting here. Your machine is empty. Let's go to cycle one. Now we are fetching the multiply, right? Cycle one, we fetch the multiply. Nothing is happening on this part of the machine. You're fetching it, and at the end of the cycle, you latch it into the uh, instruction register, right? Okay, that's done. Cycle two. Oh. Okay, I shouldn't do this. <laughs> So let's see what happens in cycle two, because that's the solution for cycle two. <laughs> so what do, I, what, what do I do in cycle two? What needs to happen? I need to have a better pen that can actually write. Okay, in cycle two, hopefully, if you cannot see it, please shout because I'm not uh, seeing. Oh, I don't know if that's the screen, but that's okay. Uh, okay, in cycle two, we're going to decode this instruction and we're going to fetch the next instruction. So what does it mean to decode this instruction? Let's look at what's happening in cycle two, when we move to cycle two. Decoding an instruction means you take the instruction, first you access the register file with the source registers, R1 and R2 in this case, and you take the source, let's say for, for, for the first source, you take the source and the second source, you take the source, and put it into the reservation station entry allocated to that multiply, which means that we first need to allocate the reservation station entry. First thing you do, you allocate the reservation station entry for multiply, and you basically take the first reservation station that's empty, which means that you really need to have allocated bits over here and some way of allocating this. But I'm going to ignore this because there's a lot of complexity otherwise that you need to know. I'm, I just want to give you the concepts first. So you allocate the reservation station entry. So multiply now gets the reservation station entry X. And you read the source, the first source, put it into here, basically copy one. There's no tag and value. So for no tag, I'm going to do squiggly. Because if valid bit is one, I don't care what's in the tag. Because the value is valid. And I read the second source register. If I have multiple ports, I can do that in one cycle, right? Two ports in one cycle. And I get this squiggly two, right? That sounds good. Now I've allocated my first register, uh, first instruction into the reservation station that's appropriate for it, which is the multiplier reservation station. Now we're not done yet with this instruction because now we need to ensure that this instruction, when it produces its value, is linked to later instructions that consume that value. And how do we do that? Well, the destination register is R3. And I've allocated reservation station X for this. So I'm going to rename R3 to X. And this is how I rename R3 to X, by making it invalid in the register alias table and by associating a tag X with it. Basically, this says that R3 is going to be produced by the instruction in the reservation station numbered X. Right. That's it. We're done with renaming the first instruction. And, at, and concurrently, of course, the fetch engine is fetching the next instruction. That's the end of cycle two, basically. So if I want to check my results, I think I'm correct. That's good. <laughs> so the machine, or at least my mind, is working correctly so far. OK, so this is, uh, the, big, uh, this is the end of the second, uh, second cycle now, because I've decoded this instruction. Uh, do I want to say anything over here? Let's, let's keep going. Okay, let's look at the third cycle. Now, in the third cycle, this instruction can actually execute, right? Basically, this first starts its execution. So there, there needs to be some logic in one of these cycles. And I'm not going to tell you exactly which one because it really de depends on the design of the machine. That checks the readiness. How do you figure out that this instruction is ready? Basically, you look at the valid bits. Both, both, both sources are ready, which means that this instruction can wake up. 
and execute and can be selected. It's selected because it's the only instruction that's ready. Right? So there needs to be some logic either in the decode stage or in the execute stage, which is really dependent on your critical part, critical path, that does this and does a wake up. Uh, I like it thinking of it in the decode stage. So you wake up the instruction such that it's ready for execute. It, it executes in the next cycle. So let's assume that it's in the decode stage now. Ignore the fact that we've lengthened the decode stage. So this is why out-of-order execution engines actually have long pipelines because you need to do some of the bookkeeping to ensure that. But we're going to ignore that for now. So this instruction is ready to execute because both of its source are ready. So in the third cycle, it gets dispatched into the functional units. Dispatch means you take... Uh, the bookkeeping information, which is x, tag, and the value, and go into the multiplier pipeline, which is going to take six cycles. And at the end, you're going to broadcast tag and value. Okay. So there's something else going on in the third cycle. We're decoding the next instruction, and we're fetching the third instruction. So let's decode this instruction now. So how do we decode this instruction? Remember, we're going to allocate a reservation station entry. In this case, it's an add, so we're going to allocate the first available reservation station entry from the adder unit, A. We're going to read the source registers, R3 and R4. R3 looks like this. Without thinking, we're going to copy it here. 0, X, value squiggly, because I don't care about the value, because somebody else is going to write to it clearly. And that somebody else is the instruction that's in the reservation station X. Right. And I'm going to read the register 4. It turns out to be valid. So I'm going to put it over here. It's valid. Tag is squiggly. Value is 4. OK? We're not done with the renaming of this instruction yet, because we're, it's writing to register 5. Now we need to rename register 5 with the location that we put this instruction, with the name of the location that we put this instruction. So we put this instruction to reservation station A. So we're going to make register 5's valid bit to 0 and rename this to A. And this won't matter. Now we rename register 5 such that any instruction that reads this version of register 5 will know where to get it from. Reservation state, the instruction that's going to, uh, that's going to produce that value will, is sitting in reservation station A. And in the meantime, again, remember, in the decode logic, there's one more thing we need to do. We need to check the readiness of this. And you can imagine how to do that while you're writing to it. You can also check the readiness of it, right, with some logic, with some combination logic. But clearly, this instruction is not ready because this, both of its sources are not ready. right? And you can easily check the readiness, right? Basically, you, have, you take this bit that you're reading from the register file, and you take the second valid bit, if, the, if you add them, and if they're both one, the instruction that you're putting into the reservation station is ready to execute. Right. That's the wake-up logic while you're putting into the reservation station. But of course, there needs to be a separate wake-up logic for things that are already in the reservation station that are need, uh, waiting, and we'll see that also. So it's not that easy. But this is one way of actually checking the readiness of the instruction while you're decoding it, and such that in the next cycle, it can be executed. So I'm ignoring some parts over here. But in the machine, you need to have uh, another bit over here probably saying it's woken up and uh, it, it's selected for execution in the next cycle. Because only one instruction can go into the uh, adder unit, and that instruction is the one that's selected. This is not an issue over here, but if you have multiple instructions that waking up at the same time, only one can be selected. So there, there is some state machine over here that I'm going to ignore for now. But know that it's there and know that it does the job. Okay, so we renamed this instruction also. So that's the end of cycle three. Let's hope that I've got it right. What do you think? I think I've got it right. That's good. But this is still the easy part. <laughs> okay, so that's cycle three. Uh, now we have renamed two instructions. I guess I'll ask you the question. I guess I already added. Does the tag have to be the idea of the reservation station entry? And you know my answer, it's no. You just need to know, allocate a reservation station entry, but the tag can be completely independent. It could be, for example, the reorder buffer entry. I'm going to ignore the reorder buffer over here, but uh, if you want precise exceptions, you also need to put the instruction into the reorder buffer while you're doing all of this renaming. 
But the tag just needs to be an identifier of the instruction that's going to write to the register. And everybody else that's going to read that register needs to be associated with that tag. You can make the tag anything, actually. It doesn't even have to be the reorder buffer ID. You just need to have that association between the register and the tag. So, of course, if you don't make the tag, uh, the ID over here, you need to store the destination tag over here also. Actually, we are implicitly storing the destination tag here, which is X here, which is A here. But if it's something else, you need to store the destination tag such that you broadcast it as well. Okay. And in most machines today, it's, uh, uh, this is uh, Thomas Lowe's machine. It, it worked this way. But in most machines today, tag is different from uh, their reservation station ID. It's it's separate free list of tags, basically, physical registers. Okay, that's the end of the third cycle. Now let's let's see what happens in the fourth cycle. When we move from third cycle to fourth cycle, this ad is happily executing, hopefully. This ad is going to stay in the reorder buffer because it's not ready. The logic keeps checking whether it's ready or not. It's not ready. Too bad. But now we can decode this and we can fetch the next instruction. So let's decode this instruction. Let's rename it. How do we rename this instruction? We take the source registers R2 and R6. Oh, wait, before that, we allocate a reservation station entry. So this is occupied clearly, so we're going to allocate reservation station B for this instruction that's being decoded. We're going to read the source registers R2 and R6, and we're going to do it this way. One, tag squiggly, value two. Read register six. One, squiggly, value six. And immediately we realize that this is actually ready. Remember the logic over here? So this is going to execute in the next cycle because both of its sources are ready, right? But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We just know that it's, it can be executed. And we are not done with the renaming of this yet. We're going to rename R7 to B, which means that we're going to set this to zero Set the tag to B. Now we have three renamed registers in the register file because we have renamed three instructions, none of which are complete yet. Okay. That's, that's the end of the fourth cycle. We're done with it. Let's check our results. Looks good, right? Okay. So we're simulating the Thomas Law's machine, basically. Right. So, uh, okay. Some points here. This add that we just placed is now ready to execute at the end of the fourth cycle, right? It's ready because both of its sources are ready, as you can see. And it wakes up and it's selected to be executed in the adder at the fifth cycle. And we're, we're going to move to the sixth cycle. So this is basically an example of auto-order dispatch. Because we moved this out of the way and placed it into the reservation station, it didn't stall the pipeline and now this independent add can execute. And that's what's going to happen in fifth cycle. Uh, this multiply is still happily executing. This add is waiting for its dependent instruction. This add can now execute because we've determined in the next cycle that both of its sources are ready. And we're going to decode soon this fourth instruction, and we're going to fetch the next instruction. Let's now decode uh, the, f the fourth instruction. Uh, what is that? Oh, it's this one. So add R8, R9, place, uh, put the result into R10. The first step, we allocate the next available reservation station. So R10 is going to be renamed to C. We're going to read R8 and R9. R8 is this one. R9 is this one. They both happen to be ready. And you know what will happen in the next cycle. Because they're both ready, we're going to get this executed. Okay. So we're going to rename R10 to C. We're not done with this instruction yet. Now we set R10's valid bit to zero, and the tag is C. The instructions that are going to source R10 later on are going to source C. OK. I think we're done with cycle five also. So this was going from cycle four to five. Make sense? Still simple. More fun will come later. <laughs> and we don't even have memory instructions here. OK, so let's check our results. I think it's correct. Yeah, looks nice. The good thing is I can check only the red parts that are the deltas. 
Okay, cool. So that's correct. Now we're moving from, this is the end of the five, fifth cycle. We're going to move to the sixth cycle now. Uh, as I said, add at RC is ready to execute, so we're going to execute it. But this multiply is still happily executing. This is not so happily waiting. This is, this add is also the second add in B is happily executing. And now we can execute this add because it's also independent. We've determined that in the previous cycle. We're going to decode. Uh, what instruction is this? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, and then we're going to fetch the next one. Okay, so let's decode this instruction. Multiply R7, R10 into R11. So the first step, allocate a reservation station entry, which is Y in this case, so R11 will go into Y. We're going to source the registers R7 and R10. Well, look what happens here. R7, valid bit is 0, tag is B, value we don't care because it's going to be produced by the instruction that's, ex that's currently actually executing that happens to be in reservation station B. And R10, valid bit is 0, tag is C, value is squiggly because it's not ready. And the value is going to come from the instruction that's in reservation station C. Right, which has also started executing in this cycle. So none of these values are ready, so in the next cycle, we're not going to be able to execute this instruction that we just placed into Y. Right? But both of these instructions, so this instruction is dependent on two different instructions, as you can see. Okay, the last thing we do over here is rename the destination register, which is R11. R11 is going to be produced by the instruction that we've just written into the reservation station Y. Okay? And you can always sanity check your simulation. One, two, three, four, five. Five different registers are written, and we rename five different registers. It's beautiful to design simulators for these machines, right? That's essentially what you do to validate your simulations also. Okay, cool. Now let's move to the next cycle, but before that we verify our results, uh, and it looks correct. Again, that's good. Assuming this is the golden result, of course. <laughs> Assuming I didn't mis make a mistake here, but I hope, I, I hope not. Uh, okay, this is, this is the end of cycle seven. Now let's see what happens uh, when we move to cycle, uh, oh, cycle six. Uh, let's see what happens in cycle seven. Basically, this multiply will keep happily executing. Oh, sorry, this is E5, right? And this will keep unhappily waiting, happily executing, happily executing, and this instruction, we, remember, uh, we determined that it cannot execute in the previous cycle, so it's going to wait in the reservation station until it's source already, and this instruction we're going to decode now, and there's no more instruction in the pipeline uh, that we're going to bring to, otherwise we can be here for a really long time. Uh, okay, so let's decode this instruction now. Basically, R5, R11 are the sources, but before that, we allocate a reservation station entry, which is D. So we're going to rename R5 to D. Uh, and the destination is the same as the source. So we do the renaming only after we read the source registers, right? So we first read the source registers, R5 and R11. You don't, you don't do the destination register renaming first. You first need to read the source registers put them into the reservation station, and only after that, rename the destination register. So don't make the mistake of renaming the destination register first, right? Otherwise, you won't get the correct linkage. Uh, this instruction will be dependent on itself, actually, if you rename it the wrong way. But this is interesting to think about because you can make a mistake like this in your design of the processor, and this instruction becomes dependent on itself. Well, why did it happen, right? Maybe you renamed it incorrectly. Uh, okay. So we, we uh, source the uh, source registers, R5 and R11, and this is simple as putting this here, 0A squiggly, 0Y squiggly, uh, Y squiggly, which means that this instruction is going to be dependent on the instruction that's in reservation station A as well as in reservation station Y. And if you want to check that that's correct, you want to verify that R11 is coming from reservation station Y, and R5 is coming from reservation station A, actually. Okay? So you can check the correctness of it that way as well. So now that we've actually sourced the source registers, we're going to rename the destination register R5 
which happens to be also the source register. But now R5 will be renamed to D as opposed to A. So we're not going to change the valid bits because it's still going to be produced. But now we have a new definition of R5. Previously, R5 was going to be produced by uh, the instruction that's in C. But now we've renamed it to D. All other instructions that are coming come later are going to get it from the instruction that's in reservation station D. That's the beauty of doing in-order renaming. Right? Now you can actually preserve the dependencies. So you can keep writing to the register, but you'll always get the correct value based on the program order. Right? That's the idea. OK, but we don't have any other instructions. So if you had other instructions that are sourcing R5 in the future, they would source this instruction, uh, this reservation station. OK, now we've renamed all of the instructions over here. So if you look at this, uh, right, let's first verify cycle 7. I hope it's correct. Yeah, AY. OK, it looks good, D. So one nice question, exam question, could be, in fact, this could be uh, an exercise question also. This actually is something that's done a lot in computer architecture. When you look at a machine, you're given this part. The question may be, oh, wait a second. OK, there you go. <laughs> you're given this part only. The question may be, what is the code? <laughs> Does that sound good? <laughs> I'm not going to have you do that right now, but it's doable. It's actually relatively easily doable. There's a trick over here because something is renamed twice. That's the major trick. But you can actually reconstruct at least uh, partially most of the code. Maybe not exact register numbers because you don't actually know the mapping to the registers, perhaps. But actually, you can construct a lot of them also. But that's actually a good way of knowing a uh, good way of uh, seeing if you actually understand how an out-of-order machine renames instructions. Right? So I would recommend that you take a look at that. Uh, there will be a question in the exercise, uh, practice exercises. It's, not, it doesn't, it's, it's actually easy once you understand how this works. Basically, you reverse engineer. The forward problem is, of course, what we just did. The forward problem is you get the code, and the question will be, at the end of cycle 7, what's the state of the reservation stations? Or what's the state of the register file? Right? That's the forward problem. But the reverse problem is, given that this is your state, what's the code that you've executed? <laughs> OK, this is cycle 7. Now there, there's going to be more interesting things at, at the end of cycle 7, right? At the, actually, at the end of cycle 8. Let's look at cycle 8. This multiply is still happily executing, but it's finishing its execution. Uh, this is still waiting. Uh, this is also finishing its execution. Now your problem actually is exacerbated here. This is going to happily execute. This is going to wait. And this is going to wait also because it was dependent on two things, if you remember from the previous cycle. Now these two, there's a special thing that's going to happen here, right? What's going to happen? <laughs> Let's see. This Multiply, remember, is uh, multiply takes six cycles. So at the last stage of its execution, it's going to broadcast its tag and the value it produces such that all dependent instructions can capture the value and the tag. So I'm going to assume that the value is produced at six. The tag of the multiply coming out of the multiplier pipeline is x. So the multiply, let's, uh, multiply is going to broadcast this tag and value to everywhere in the machine, all tag and value locations in the machine. Now let's, say, let's take a look at the logic to do that. This tag basically goes to, uh, let's do it this way, here, 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 here. And what does this mean? Basically, at every point where you have a tag and this tag comes, you have a comparator. Is this tag that's being broadcast, I'll call it B tag, equal to the tag that's stored in this location? So I have one comparator here, one comparator here, one comparator here, one comparator here. Four other comparators here, four here, four here, and 11 comparators in the register file. So this broadcast tag needs to be compared to every other tag in the machine. That's the complexity. Uh, OK, let's do that comparison. 
So we're broadcasting X, right? X matches here. Voila. We were producing R3 and no one wrote R3. So what, what's going to happen when there's a match? There's a match. Of course, hopefully it's a match when the, uh, when the valve bit is zero. If the valve bit is one and there's a match, that means you've got you to ignore that match because it's a stale thing. That's why I like the squigglies because squigglies basically get rid of all of that thing. But basically, it's matched here. Now we make the register valid and the value becomes six. Uh, oh, so, oh yeah, thank you, thank you. Value becomes two, excellent, because we're, it's a multiply. Why do I think six? Okay, let's, let's roll back. The value source and destination, is, uh, two sources are one and two. You multiply one and two, you get two. Unless you have a fault, you get six. But in this case, we get two. So, of course, now you're seeing that the value also gets broadcast all over the machine. Let's do it with a different color. This machine looks complicated now, right? So, what happens is, when the tag matches, you capture the value. So, we capture two. So you basically do it concurrently across all of the places in the machine, and this tag matches over here also, so this becomes valid, and the value becomes two. And concurrently, some logic figures out that, oh, this instruction now is ready. So in the next cycle, at the end of cycle eight, it can start executing. Is there any other X? There is no other X, but you do a lot of comparisons just to find those dependent instructions. Right? That's basically how we've supplied the value to dependent instructions. And you need to do it for all functional units. So remember this add was also finishing. R2, R6. So this add was B over here, right? R2, R6. So addition, now I've done the addition correctly, eight. It's gonna broadcast its tag B. And it has a separate path, meaning this tag also gets broadcast Everywhere where there's the word tag, right? And instructions that are waiting for this tag, which is B, will capture the value. So this value also gets broadcast. I don't have enough colors, I think, over here. Oh, I have black. This value also gets broadcast everywhere in the machine. I'll do it this way. Okay, so we're broadcasting it. So anywhere where the tag matches, the value becomes eight. So in this case, the tag matches, it becomes one, value becomes eight, because we're producing R7. And R7 is not rewritten in the register file. Uh, where, where it does, it, it matches here. So the value over here also becomes eight. And this can become squiggly. But this instruction is not ready because it's waiting for another source to be broadcast with tag C. Make sense? So now we can execute in the next cycle. Hopefully I've done it right. So this is the verification of cycle eight. Now in the next cycle, cycle nine, uh, this is going to write its results, but that's okay. I think we've, we've kind of done it. Uh, we're not gonna go through the detail of it uh, for the rest. But now this instruction can start executing, E1. This instruction is going to finish somehow, and then this instruction is going to broadcast this tag, and then dot, dot, dot. These are, I think, still waiting. So basically, you repeat the same thing in the next instruction. Okay, but let's look at what happened at cycle eight, because cycle eight is the most interesting part here. You can keep uh, doing the same thing. Multiply at reservation station X, broadcast this tag and value. That's what we did basically, right? And add at reservation station B also broadcast this tag and value. And all register, reservation station and register alias table entries waiting for the corresponding tag capture the broadcast value and set their valid bits. And add at RSA becomes ready to execute. That's what happens all in cycle eight, right? And now you can move to cycle nine. Uh, so now you can see the complexity of the machine, right? So you have a lot of comparators all across the machine. But this is really data flow. You're really moving the data, flowing the data into the instructions, sources of the instructions. And tags are just a way of communicating the data values. Okay. So if you keep doing this, you'll get this execution timeline and uh, you will finish in 20 cycles. 
Okay, what have we done? Let me, uh, let me go back to this cycle 7 if I didn't destroy it. Oh boy. I guess I did destroy it. <laughs> but I have a backup somewhere. I hope. Yes? What happens after, now we finished uh, in Rick, the, the X, what happens afterwards? Like with the table, do, is there a mod like the use the entry and you're finished there? Or? Oh, you finished this X. Yes, that's a good question. Basically, you need to deallocate it, recycle it. So I didn't show how its allocation and deallocation is done, but there needs to be a bit that's saying, oh, this is allocated. It will become zero. It won't be allocated anymore, but this is still one. This is allocated. And there will be unallocated entries. Uh, so next instruction can come and allocate it, basically. I didn't show that logic over there. But yes, you need to remove that from there. And of course, here I assumed imprecise exceptions. If you have precise exceptions, you do something different. There, is, there should be a reorder buffer somewhere. And reorder buffer also gets the broadcast tag and value. <laughs> right. So things become more complicated. But of course, it, this is the principle. I mean, in principle, machines work this way. But in reality, there's a lot of optimization that goes on to minimize the amount of uh, complexity. So OK, uh, let me finish with one thing. This is the state of the rat and reservation station in cycle 7. Uh, I mean, it's the same thing. I assure you of that, except I omitted x, y, z, t over here. You could get away with two reservation stations here. So all six instructions are renamed, and uh, um, basically, you have all the six instructions in the machine. You can, I assure you, construct this data flow graph based on what you see in this machine. Maybe not exactly uh, the, uh, mm, the register values. But let's do that very quickly. I hope we'll have time. I hope you'll give me some time to do it. Uh, because this is very interesting. So let's do that. So what's in the machine right now? Let's look at uh, this thing. We have, a, we have an ad. And it's going to produce A. Its inputs are X and 4. OK? And then we have another ad. It's going to produce B. I'm just looking here, right? Because it's, uh, it's, 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 it's going to produce B. And its inputs are 2 and 6. So this is how you construct, reconstruct. This is the reverse engineering that I mentioned. We have another ad. It's going to produce C. It's in reservation station C. Its inputs are 8 and 9. And then we have another ad. I hope I'll be able to connect these eventually. It's going to produce D. Its inputs are A and Y. Cool, now I can connect some things, but let's, let's move to the multiplies. Uh, OK, let me do this. We have a multiply. No, what's the multiply, I guess? Uh, it's going to produce x, and its inputs are 1 and 2. And then we have another multiply over here. It's going to produce y, and its inputs are y, no, b, and c, right? So now we can connect these things. Now let's try to connect them. So this y, OK, this is, this is a puzzle right now. This b goes here. This c goes here. What else? Am I missing something? A, there's an a. Oh, yeah, there's the a. This a goes here. x, where does x go? Oh, x, there's x. Well. Now you know the data dependencies, right? These are 2, 6, 1, 2, 8, 9. B, C are connected. That's good. This B is being produced. This C, this D is output. No one is reading it yet, I assume. That's good. And you're given this also. Ah, that looks interesting. <laughs> Meaning, what can you do? Now I know the name for X, right? It's really register 3. So X is really register 3. We just renamed it to x, right? d, register 5. Register 5. So this instruction is producing register 5. b is r7. This instruction is producing r7. c is r10. c is r10. This instruction is producing r10. And y is r11. So this instruction is producing r11, right? And there's some more magic. 
assuming this is the only thing that happened in the machine, now you know that one is in the register file. <laughs> so you can guesstimate that this is R1, and this is R2, and this is also R2, maybe. <laughs> but it's R2 because no instruction has finished execution yet. And this is R6, and this is R4, and this is R8, and this is R9. Now we have the data flow graph for this program. And we've constructed it solely by looking at this. That's why this is a data flow machine. Because you actually, by looking at the state of the machine, you can construct the data flow graph. And I guess a good exercise is to take, go from the state of flow graph to the sequential instruction order. It's not that hard, actually. <laughs> It's doable. It may not be perfectly done because you may not know the exact ordering between the independent instructions. Okay? All right. We'll start from here next time.